Today on Locked On Canadians, very bizarre ending to that Habs game against Dallas. We've got lots of mailback questions from you guys on the trade deadline that's coming up. So we're going to tackle all of that in one moment. For Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to episode 575 of Locked On Canadians. We want to thank you all for making us your first listen of the day. We're available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube for free. My name is Laura Sab, also known as The Active Stick, and I'm joined, as always, by Scott Matlove, Habs, Eyes on the Prize. We've got a packed, packed episode for everybody tonight. Scott, how are you doing on today? We are recording on St. Patrick's Day, and I'm feeling a little bit worse for wear. How about you? I, I'm doing all right, and I was not anticipating uh, in the middle of March in a season where the Canadians are in last place to be this heated about a hockey game that doesn't matter at the end of the day. And yet, just here we are. I am annoyed here. at, I, I mean, maybe not at the Montreal Canadiens, like for once, but like just, <laughs> oh, for the love of God, one peaceful night is all I ask for from this sport and from this team. And I can't even get that. So here we all are. All right, let's talk about the good first real quick and then get into the meat of, of what happened tonight. Uh, the good, the Canadians played an exciting game end to end. That first 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 period was really fun. In fact, the whole game would have been fun if it didn't end on such a bizarre, disappointing note. Uh, Jake Allen came back, looked fine. I uh, didn't. He wasn't tested too too much, I don't think. Or no, he was. Dallas actually out- outscored the Montreal Canadiens by a lot. Um, and uh, Christian Dvorak came back and he seemed okay as well. Nick Suzuki, Cole Caulfield again. You, you can't say anything, you know, anything negative about that. Brendan Gallagher looked like a scary injury, but then he was back. Still, unfortunately, cannot hit the net. Uh, poor guy. You know, we're, we're, we're rooting for him to at least get, get an even strength goal before the end of the season. Um, and and there, were, there were a lot of good things, I have to say. First game without Ben Schrott, or second game without Ben Schrott, technically. Uh, and, and I, you know, Corey Schooneman had a first goal. Like, we, we can't even forget. See, it all gets drowned out. And then also, you know, the Canadians playing four forwards in a power play in the overtime. That was so amazing. The only thing is, though, they didn't do a lot of moving. I think that when you take those players, if they were a little bit more dynamic, like they regularly are on a regular power play, I feel like that could have been so much more exciting. But it was still really nice to see Marte saying that we do something fun, do something interesting, throw something out there and test. And the Canadians, honestly, like I think overall, I was happy with their game, but the officiating on both sides was a little bit bizarre. There was this one point, I can't even remember who on Dallas, maybe Klingberg, I have no idea, like, literally sat and, and, and like, laid down on Laurent Dauphin, and no call. What was, no call. What was that, right? There were so many things, like, you know, we were complaining so much about all of these things, and then finally, at the end, with about 10 seconds, maybe even less to go, Dallas scores while Tyler Sagan is tying up Jake Allen's stick. And then you see, you know, everybody's going to the, to the vestiaire, the the, the, the locker room, the dressing room. And then they get called back because it was like automatically reviewed or something. And then it was still called a goal, even though in the replay, everybody could see that Tyler Sagan was tying up Jake Allen's stick. It was so clear. And if this game had playoff implications in any way, whether it was to get points to make the playoffs or whether it was in the playoffs, I would have been so upset. This game has no consequence at all. And I'm still quite upset because what is goaltender interference? If not that, if you, if you can take the goaltender stick. I (laughs) I don't get it. I don't get it. I have two quotes here that both come from Jake Allen and they are uh, not uh, very, uh, redeeming for nhl officiating um this comes from habs and high heels on twitter the first one is uh the habs jake allen on the stars ot winning goal sagan is behind me in the goal crease doesn't let me turn my blocker and that's why the puck goes through the seven hole 
So I'm not really sure what else is goalie interference. And then to follow it up, I think one of the referees said it was goalie interference and then the league turned it over. I don't know. I don't know the whole deal, but that one I'm a little disappointed with. An official on the ice made the call that this was goaltender interference. They called it a good goal. They went to a league review, and then the league said no, even though the replay clearly shows that Sagan's stick is hooked around his blocker and would have been considered interference. I don't know what goaltender interference is. We've seen Canadians' goals taken away for far less, and we've seen goals stand for far worse. There is no baseline in the NHL for what goaltender interference is. And I was talking with our good friend Ian Boisvert about this, and he goes, at some point, this is going to happen in a playoff game, and people are going to be pissed. And it's and that's what might maybe might cause something to change. I don't know what goalie interference is. Goalies don't know what goalie interference is. Referees <laughs> don't know what goalie interference is. I don't think the league knows what goalie interference is. I just want a baseline. I'm not asking for perfection. I'm asking for the bare minimum. And the NHL can't even deliver that. What are we even doing here? Like, it's it's March 17th. The Canadians are in last place. This game doesn't mean a damn thing. And I'm still annoyed because it's an overarching problem across the league. And we're doing this. I feel like we've had the goalie interference discussion at least once this year already. I don't know what it is. It's not once. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to be generous to myself. And it's a sour ending on a fantastic game. Yeah, a shootout wouldn't have been any better. But, like, you're going to end the game on a blown call? Get out of my face. Get out of the Bell Center. Get out of Quebec. <laughs> Do not come back to Canada and just <laughs> go away. Just go away. Stop <laughs> making my life that much more difficult. I, that's all I'm asking for. Holy Mackinac, Jesus Christ Almighty above, figure it out. <laughs> oh, um, my I'm, God. I'm almost scared because we're out of time in our first segment. What we are going to do is we're going to turn it over to our <laughs> mailbag in literally just one moment. While Scott calms down, I'm going to tell you about something that does make him happy. It's not goaltender interference. It is built for Built Bar, we love Built Bar on this podcast. It is a protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar, and it is high in protein, low in sugar. It is delicious. They're all made with real chocolate. They're low in calorie, if that's something that you care about, and they give you energy, and it's just a treat. They have 18 delicious regular flavors, but you know what? They always come up with special edition flavors that are always really cool, and those ones are not to be missed. Like I said, they're really yummy. I use them as breakfast, and Scott uses them for hiking, and we can vouch that they are delicious, and if you want to try these Bilt Bars that we keep talking about, you want to go to Bilt.com, and enter promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. That is built.com for 15% off your order of Built Bars. Scott, have you taken a breath? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. It's fine. I think the neighbors might be a little concerned, but whatever. They they didn't sign <laughs> they, up for this, but whatever. They'll get over it. Do they know about goaltender interference? At this they point, they understand. might. They're going to wonder why there's an insane man screaming downstairs at 11 o'clock at night. But you know what? Um, it, it, as long as the rent doesn't go up, it doesn't matter. It's fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> All right. So normally on Fridays, we do a mailbag. This week, we got a lot of questions. So in case we run out of time, don't worry. We're going to do the rest of the mailbag questions that we don't get to today on our Monday episode. However, we are going to prioritize trade deadline related questions that you've asked us. And if you ever want to ask us questions, you can tweet them at LO underscore Canadians. You can also email LockedOnCanadians at gmail.com. Uh, and you can also e uh, tweet one of us directly, which sometimes you do, at the active stick for me and at Scott Matla for Scott. Scott, what is our first question in our mailbag this week? Uh, jumping in and sticking with the trade deadline stuff for right now to start. Uh, this one comes from Randy Hansen. Who is the surprise traded player on Monday? Uh, I will allow you to open this up to the entire NHL, not just the Montreal Canadiens. Oh, 
oh wow <laughs> you changed the rules on me i was thinking about the montreal canadians and i was like really nobody except for like their three untouchables would really surprise me in the nhl i think that oh i was gonna say mark andre fleury <laughs> I I I think he doesn't want to go anywhere. I think he's probably a risk for any team that tries to pick him up. But so many people need goaltending. I and I think uh, Flurry is a fun one because he only wants to go somewhere that's going to win. But you know he was in Vegas and that kind of stabbed him in the back. Um, I I have been very curious and I've been thinking and I've been thinking. Mark Giordano is not really a surprise anymore for this. Um. I think the biggest thing, and one of the names that's kind of fallen off a little bit, I think Jake DeBrusque is going somewhere uh, on by Monday at the least. He wanted to trade earlier this year, and that kind of you know uh, fell off a little bit and has been very quiet. Uh, and then I think the Canadians, I don't see the big surprise being anything unless they get a big package for like a Christian Dvorak or something. But I can't see any uh, big surprises uh, coming from the Habs now that Chirot is – uh, gone and we have to find new content to talk about up until the trade deadline <laughs> so <laughs> we don't we don't work we we have no shortage of content real quick uh the can't use press conference we were going to talk about it but because we have so many mail mailback questions we are going to listen and dissect and talk about the things we learned from it on monday we also have a couple of scouting re reports on uh on uh oh my god ty Sim similac i keep saying similac it's not similac smilanic <laughs> smilanic <laughs> <laughs> Once you said baby formula, I couldn't. Anyway, we've got a couple of scouting rep rep reports on him that we're going to talk about Monday and Tuesday. Plus, we are trying to line up a special expert on college hockey for our Wednesday episode. So please stay tuned for all of that. In the meantime, Scott, what's next in our mailbag? Uh, another one from Randy Hansen. Do you want to get another first round pick in 2024 to make it three straight years? Or is that a bridge too far this year to consider? I think... I would want one for sure, but I don't know what the Canadians are going to send away for it. Yeah, and and the thing about doing a 2024 pick is I admittedly do not know much about that draft class and what uh, who is in there right now. So I couldn't even begin to look at that and figure out, yeah, that sounds like something I'd want to do right now. 2023, if you want to give us another 2023 first round pick, Absolutely. I will take that in a heartbeat. 2023's draft class is supposedly stacked to the brim in round one. So yeah, I'll happily take a look at that. Um, this one comes from Chris um, at Loru City on Twitter. If I pronounced that wrong, I'm very sorry. How amazing would it be if Florida tanked next year and we got Connor Bedard for Ben Sherratt? <laughs> Here's the thing. Florida is in really tough in the off season. They really need to win now because they've got so many players that they're going to have to resign. They've got like, they're way up against the cap. Anyway, they're trying to like desperately clear, clear cap space. They're in a win now mode. There's no guarantee that Bob Bobrovsky isn't going to fall completely off a cliff next season. And he, he might just, you know, the, the team in front of him could be great and he might fall off a cliff and tank their entire season. So it's not out of the realm of possibility, but I would love to tell people that they got Connor Bedard for Ben Sherratt. Um, And this one comes from uh, Jan Marco. Uh, question for the trade deadline. Do you guys think the Habs will acquire at least one big name? If yes, why? I think no, just simply because I do think they want a big name. But I think they're going to use NHL Draft Weekend as their big way to trade the players that they've still got with term, such as a Jeff Petrie, unless a crazy offer comes along. And Kent Hughes even said that. He said, unless something that blows, us, blows them away comes along, Kulak and Petrie are going to stick around and they're going to try and find a good situation for Petrie. They also expressed that they didn't seem to be too interested in trading uh, Dvorak. Uh, and, and, and they said really great things about Kulak, which made me feel really good about this organization with the, ma the management and the way that they think. But unless something blows them away, they said they're, they're, they're kind of, they said they're done, right? Like it's also partly an invitation for GMs to blow them away with an offer, but I think they are going to go big. And I do think that they're going to use the trade deadline to move some pieces off the cap and get somebody big. Uh, I'm of the same mind in that too, in that I think they're big, their big moves or big name moves are going to be in the off season. And I look at the big names who are on the market, like they're going to go to, playoff contending teams 
Claude Giroux is not coming to Montreal. You know, um, wow, I can't remember some of the other big names out there. Ben Trock can probably come back if they really wanted to, but like <laughs> Brock Besser's name has been thrown around. I can't see that happening in season one. The Canucks are pushing for a playoff spot. So unless that that's what they're asking for in a Jeff Petrie deal, like I, I just don't see it right now. It's, it's like you said, it's a, an off season thing where they have time to analyze, sit down, probably talk with these guys a little bit more, be like, Hey, okay. You got these, this amount of time under Martin St. Louis, if you want to move on, we'll understand. We'll get you into a situation. If you want to stay, all right, what do we need to do then to make this work? And there's going to be a lot of those conversations this off season and, that's just part of the job of rebuilding and everything. We've got time for one more question in this segment. Uh, sh- sh- let's see what we've got here. Um, with the rebuild, will the Habs make a splash? This actually ties in. Will the Habs make a splash in free agency? Who will, should they target? I'd love to see Kadri or maybe Claude Giroux. And my first thought with Nazem Kadri is his contract is going to look exactly like Thomas Hurdle's. So buyer beware that he is coming off his career season on that one. I would love Nazem Kadri in Montreal, if only because it would torture Leaf fans forever and ever. Amen. But man, he's going to be expensive and you got to clear cap space if you want to pay for that. I, I agree. Like for me, I like Nazem Kadri and I, I would like him on this team. Uh, I, I think that he's a player who's really intense and sometimes he gets a little bit dirty. So he definitely would have to clean that up. But I think he's just going to cost way, way too much. I do think, though, that the Canadians are going to try to go after somebody big, especially if like the trade deadline is a little bit before free agency. Right. So they're going to try and do some wheeling and dealing and look at the shape of their team. And then they'll know what kind of big pieces to add, because I think that. We talk about this a lot. Rebuild, rebuild. I think I think they think that if Carey Price comes back and he comes back healthy, they can go for it. They've got some good pieces, but they need stronger pieces as a whole. So if they can move out the pieces that they don't think that are working, I don't necessarily think they should go after a for- forward, actually. I think they need to work on that defense. That defense looks really, really thin to me. So that's what I would do if I were the Canadians. In the meantime... We're going to be back in just one moment to talk about the rest of your mailback questions. But first, it is that time of year again, as college basketball's tournament is finally upon us. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, BetOnline.net is the number one source for all your sports betting needs and information. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information needs including live betting and your favorite vegas casino games head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action bet online is where the game starts all right what more do we have in our mailbag this week (laughs) Uh, from Goalie Droid, out of all the upcoming free agents, who would you want to have as Nick Suzuki's mentor aside from Patrice Bergeron since we already know Suzuki looks up to him and wants to model his game after him? Do you know what's really funny is I think it should be Claude Giroux. Uh, and, and the reason that I think that is because Claude Giroux does have the propensity to go off the rails and and and, and once in a while. he's He's not like Patrice Bergeron angelic good right like he's not he's not somebody that you would call the classiest player in the nhl or the best behaved one by best behaved one by any means and nick suzuki is a good boy but there's something about the way that claude Giroux has persevered on like the, these incredibly emotionally roller coaster type teams the ups the downs the coaching changes the goaltending meltdowns like there's like i i follow the flyers pretty closely and i can guarantee you that they are a circus right? He's come out of that and he's still a player that's worth pursuing for other teams. Like he's still got game in him, but he also is one of those guys that was, he was considered an elite player, a star player, but he was never put in the same conversation as your Connor McDavid's and your Sidney Crosby's, except for one really misguided reporter. Um, And, and so I think for me, the fact that he was able to be a top line center for a long time, 
that's that's the kind of thing that I'm looking for for Nick Suzuki, right? Like Nick Suzuki's never going to be in that Sydney Crosby cal caliber. I'm sorry, he's not. But he's an exceptionally talented and exceptionally promising young player. So you need somebody that's been through all of that to kind of mentor you and and keep you pushing. So that's what I like about his game. I wish. I, I don't know. I wish we kind of had a crystal ball and see where to see where Claude Giroux was going to get traded right now and see what his playoff run was going to be like. But I do think that Montreal could entice him if they had the right package and he wouldn't be as expensive as some of the younger players. I'm I'm going to go with something that I didn't think about because this player is a lot older. I don't see them leaving their current locale, but Evgeny Malkin, because Malkin is an extremely talented player and he's got a bit of an asshole streak in him. And Nick Suzuki <laughs> has started to stand up for himself a little bit more. But at the same time, I look at Evgeny Malkin, who takes no crap. And when he's on, he gets that eye of the tiger killer thing going. And he's just an unstoppable monster on the ice. And I think having Nick Suzuki and Evgeny Malkin on the same team would be wild. I do not think Malkin will be leaving Pittsburgh anytime soon. I think he is going to retire a Penguin. But could you imagine, even if it's only like two years, you have Evgeny Malkin to, you know, kind of, I don't want to say nurture because he doesn't seem like the kind of guy, but kind of be the uh, mentor outside, if it's not Patrice Bergeron, to Nick Suzuki. A high-skilled player with a little bit of a physical edge that he can grow on. And I think that it, that's my if I can't pick Bergeron and Kadri's going to be probably too expensive, I'm going to pick Evgeny Malkin every time. That makes sense to me. And before we go on, I just really want to quickly tell people that Scott and I are going to be on Game Over with Andrew Berkshire this weekend. After the Sens game, we're going to enjoy that because you know how we feel about the Sens. Even if you've never listened to this podcast, it is locked on Canadian. So you know how we feel about the Sens and that's going to be really fun. Scott, I think we have time. If we, if we run through them real quick, I think we have time for a lot of questions still. Um, I'm going to save the one on undrafted NCAA free agents for next week, just so I can kind of look and see who is out there. Um, just so we can touch on that. Uh, this one comes from Paul Brand show of the currently contracted goalies, which do you think will still be in the Habs organization next season? Oh, uh, absolutely going to be Carey Price. He's not going anywhere. Uh, Jake Allen might get traded in the in the um, in the draft, I don't want him to be traded. I think he's so valuable to this team. He might, uh, so I can't guarantee. I, I can't say that's a guarantee. I think the Canadians are not going to give up on Caden Primo, though. Uh, I don't see Samuel Montembeau sticking around because there's not going to be room for him. Uh, Andrew Hammond, I think they might keep. My thought for next season is Kevin Poulin will be back in Laval. He said he no longer is considering Europe as an option. He's really enjoyed his time in the AHL. He's done everything asked of him, and I think it'll be he, him and Caden Primo in the AHL next year to start. I think you have Allen and you have Price, and then then things get reassessed after that season. Then things get a little bit less cloudy, or a little more cloudy and a little bit less uh, defined. Um, I would I would be very interested. I would love to see Samuel Montemo back in a certain role, but there isn't a role for him right now. Maybe with how well he's played for the Canadians as – expected of him he can get another nhl a lot of that and andrew hammond will probably move on get another two-way nhl ahl deal and be someone's 1b goaltender who knows hopefully uh hopefully there are good things for the hamburglar i've come to really really enjoy him so um we have two that look like they came from our youtube comments and then one question that i consider off the uh, charts a little bit that we will do in this episode uh, this one comes from Sebastian and says, thanks for the content. Uh, Mark Bergevin collected a solid group of depth players, but it's clear now that there needs to be a thinning of the herd in order to make way for players with higher upside and skill. Who do you think is considered the core and who may be getting shipped out or letting their contract run out in the longer term? And the first thought I think both you and I would agree on this is Mike Hoffman and Yol Armia are probably the first two players who are on uh, that block, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and to, to be honest, for me, the core right now is for sure Cole Caulfield, Nick Suzuki, uh, Arturi Lekkinen, I think, is definitely, uh, I would consider him part of the core that the Canadians are looking at. 
Carey Price, even though he is on his way out, on the decline, whatever you want to call it, like he's still the Canadian's uh, goal goaltender. I think that they keep Jake Allen, but I wouldn't consider him core because for me, like at the end of his contract, he might sign somewhere else, you know, or they might even trade him next year. So Alexander Romana for now, I think they definitely uh, would consider him close to untouchable, not super untouchable. But other than that, I'm not seeing a whole lot like like Josh Anderson to me in my mind is part of the core like he's part of that like you know the older players that kind of mentor the younger players he's got a lot of energy he gives them he gives he's, he gives them a bit of mentorship you know that kind of stuff but i i can't i can't see anyone else jake evans to me uh is definitely part of the core but the thing with jake evans is that he's a a, a really high caliber bottom six player but they like a lot of players that they've dropped, drafted and developing, that's their ceiling. So I think that they keep Jake Allen because of the way he works and they like that. But other than that, I don't see anybody that I would consider really the core. Yeah, and I'm of the same mind. Like I thought Tyler Toffoli was part of the core here and things can change. But like I said, we know we have the handful of untouchables and Arturi Lekkanen appears to be getting added to that right now. And it, it makes me very warm inside to see that this new o- or ownership uh, leadership group here seems to think of him that way. But like you said, we'll talk about the Ken Hughes press conference and stuff after this weekend. Uh, another YouTube comment. Uh, this one comes from Mike. Excellent show. Always interesting. Laura, can you tell us about your medals in the background? And Scott, were you involved with sports? If so, which one? Thanks as always. Go Habs go. So if you can, if you watch us on YouTube, there are some medals in the back. My current setup is in my bedroom. I'm actually trying to move it to my living room because as some of you have said, my internet is a little bit slow and that's, that's, that's hampering the YouTube. So I'm not sure if this is going to be my permanent setup. Either way, my medals in the back, they are running medals. I am a long distance runner. I have been since high school. Uh, the last couple of years injuries have, and, and the pandemic have kept me off, but the half marathons that I've run, I've never run a full, I've run two Montreal half marathons, uh, which it's a super fun time and it's in the fall, which is great. Uh, I have run, one in San Diego that was my first ever. It was with team and training. I raised a lot of money. That's one of the ones that I'm really proud of. Uh, I have also run one in Boston, the BAA half marathon. I'm so, so excited about that. I was really, really lucky to be able to get a BA, like a BAA medal. And actually my ultimate goal is obviously like everybody else running the Boston marathon, qualifying for it. And the coolest race I've ever run is the Detroit international half marathon, because you start in Detroit, you cross over into Canada, you go under the tunnel back into the United States. So it's international. So at two points, like that was the most amazing race I've ever run. You wake up in the morning at butt o'clock. And then as you're crossing the bridge into Canada, you're literally going over the bridge and the sun is is rising right next to you it is gorgeous it is unbelievable and then in the tunnel like i obviously stopped real quick real quick put my foot in two countries and took a picture of myself there a selfie so really it's a cool experience like none of my times are, are particularly great um and i have suffered a lot of injuries over time it's definitely something my goal is in 2023 to run a half marathon again and then by 2024 be competing and trying to run a full marathon so I can finally qualify for Boston. And that is a very long spiel. We almost ran out of time, but Scott, there's still time for you to answer the question and for us to get to our last one. Well, I I have no qualms about ever running a marathon because I think people who want to run for 26 miles are insane and should definitely. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> well, I don't I don't like running. I am not a, I am not a runner. So uh, I did play sports in high school. I was a two sport varsity athlete. I was a football player and I was a wrestler. When I graduated, I got into Brazilian jiu jitsu, and unfortunately, college and work and uh, hockey coverage and everything took that uh, took up a good chunk of that in my free time. I haven't been able to compete in a long, long time. And since then I have since fallen out of my competitive shape in that. Uh, And then I do play pickup hockey in my free time when I have the ability to do so. Obviously the pandemic has um, 86, a good chunk of that, unfortunately. So uh, one final question, which is easier to explain the appeal of Pete Davidson or the Toronto Maple Leafs fandom? easily the appeal of pete davidson now people ask me this a lot like why is pete davidson so popular with so many uh attractive female celebrities and i literally i'm just like my conclusion is that he's just a nice guy (laughs) that's it uh the maple leaves they don't treat you like pete davidson treats you it's simple (laughs) it's so much easier to explain 
Well, yeah, liking the Maple Leafs doesn't get you stalked by Kanye West, I'm pretty sure. So I think that Hopefully is... Hopefully not. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it, there's an entire different bit of insanity involved with that. But um, anyways, that is uh, that is a story for another time. We have a handful of questions left that we will get to uh, in our next episode just because I want to do a little research on this. And there's a little bit more uh, discussion and explanation going into the other one. So I will save them. So Randy and Paul, I do have your other questions. We will get to them for Monday's show. I promise you that. And so on Monday, we will have our normal, our three up, three down. We'll recap the Suns game from the weekend and talk about some more tidbits from this week's game. We will also talk about Kenton Hughes press conference, redo some scouting reports on Scott. <laughs> Ty Smilanek. Smilanek. I I can't I don't know I'm just I'm I'm so tired it just it's it's not a good day <laughs> um but yeah and then we're gonna like if if anything crazy happens in the trade deadline there will be a bonus episode and then you know we're gonna be talking to a, one of our friends who's a college hockey expert about all the Habs prospects now and then we, maybe we can ask ask him about the undrafted NCAA players uh, Scott and that's all coming up next week so make sure you are subscribed to this podcast wherever you get your podcast or on YouTube just search Locked On Canadians and you can find us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians you'll find Scott on Twitter at Scott Matla you will find me at The Active Stick thank you so much for listening don't forget to check out our trade deadline show at Locked On Fantasy Hockey